All right. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for the first in this new season of Random Review. My name is Mike Hansen, and I'm co-coordinator of Random Review with my fellow librarian, Bonnie Brzezowski. You probably recognize us as the librarian hosts of the virtual random reviews for the past couple of years, if you've been following at home. We would like to thank our co-sponsors, Friends of the Library, who originated this program and coordinated it for 30 years. Thank you in particular to Deborah Goldenberg and Connie Georgiou, who served as co-chairs for Random Review for the past 15 and 13 years, respectively. I would also like to recognize Connie Folk, who started the program, and Lois Milango and Cheryl Mays, who also served as past chairs of the program. If you'd like to read more about the history of Random Review, you can look on our website on the Random Review webpage and look for our random interview we have. You can also find this year's schedule of reviews and recordings of previous reviews from previous years and sign up for the next random review on the website. Sorry. Um, random Review is now entering its 31st year. This new season brings a new lineup of 10 carefully selected books to be reviewed by a stellar lineup of reviewers in the next 10 months. The first of which is today's review with John Larison, senior instructor at OSU School of Writing, Literature and Film, and author of Whiskey When We're Dry. He will be reviewing the classic George Orwell book, 1984, a book that seems to repeatedly prove its enduring importance. During the review today, please feel free to submit the questions through some questions throughout the review in the questions and answer box on your screen, and we will answer them as uh, at the appropriate time. Now, I'd like to tell you a little bit more about today's reviewer, John Larison. John was born in Philomath and grew up in the Willamette Valley and surrounding area in between traveling with his parents who worked for National Geographic as filmmakers. He earned his bachelor's degree and master's degree in education from the University of Oregon and then worked as a fly fishing guide and high school English teacher in the Eugene area for several years, all while writing fiction in the evenings. He then switched gears a bit and attended OSU to earn his MFA, which is where I first got to know John. It's here I recognized his generous demeanor and his keen vision, which I think shows through in his writing with his empathy empathetic treatment of his characters and his vivid descriptions of forests, rivers, and deserts. The first book John published, The Complete Steel Header, is a how-to guide for fly fishing, no doubt heavily informed by his years of firsthand experience working as a fly fishing guide. He followed up this book with two novels, steeped in fly fishing culture of the Pacific Northwest, Northwest of Normal and Holding, Holding Lies. Reading these books, you can almost feel the water and grit of life on the river, as though you were sitting on the mossy banks of Mackenzie. His most recent novel, Whiskey When We're Dry, earned him national recognition. It was a bestseller on the Los Angeles Times and New York Times lists. It was an indie next pick, I think twice, a finalist for the Ken Kesey Award, and won the Will Rogers Medallion. It was named a best book by Old Magazine, Goodreads, Entertainment Weekly, Outside Magazine, Powell's, NPR's All Things Considered, and several others. It's described as a Western set in the late 19th century, but somewhat similar to 1984, its setting might be different from our own time, but the issues it prods and questions couldn't be more relevant today. It's as much about gender and identity as it is about horses and shootouts. It's a Western that challenges the fundamental ideals of the Western through the powerful voice of its female protagonist, who sets off an adventure on an adventure of passing as a young man. John's currently finishing up work on his next novel titled The Ancients, and I am eagerly looking forward to reading that when it's available. It's my pleasure to introduce John Larson. John. Wow. Thank you, Mike. Uh, I hope my mom's listening because that was that was awesome. Uh, I hadn't realized um, how 1984 and, and the setting of, of whiskey had some things in common. Um, that's compelling to me. Uh, I'm really looking forward to this talk today. And before I start, I just wanna, I wanna thank Mike Hansen. I wanna thank Bonnie. I wanna thank the Friends of the Library for putting this together. Um, about 10 years ago, I had the honor and privilege of reviewing Brian Doyle's Mink River uh, for this program. 
and uh, just loved the experience. I might not have read the book when I did, if not for the opportunity to review it. And it's just such a great book. Uh, if you told me that, you know, I'd get to do another review um, I, at some point in the future, I'd, I would have been really happy. If you told me that I'd be like in my bedroom uh, giving you a random review, wouldn't have thought that that was going to happen. Um, but here we are. Uh, and hopefully the technology works out. Um, I have a bit of a slideshow for us. Um, just, you know, try to keep things visually interesting for you today. Um, but really, I, I just can't wait to dive into to 1984. Um, and I'll just tell you as a bit of a preface that, you know, like many high school students, I uh, read this book, um, you know, as a teenager. And I, I maybe pretended to read it then. Um, I reread it in college, uh, but this time reading it was very different for me. And I think um, the talk I'm gonna give today, the story I'm gonna try to tell you really grows out of um, this different way that I'm seeing the book this time. Uh, fundamentally what's different is this time when I'm reading it, I'm reading it uh, as, a, as someone who's you know, devoted years to writing novels. And um, and at the same time, as, as I was reading it, I was learning a lot about George Orwell. Um, and so the book, now I have a, a different take on it, um, and I hope to, to um, convey some of that today. Um, but I also hope to tell you um, the story about George Orwell uh, and his historic moment, um, but also ultimately be telling the story of, of this book, 1984, which um, you know, is, I uh, was written over 70 years ago. Um, it's been published into every written language. There are over 2,600 editions of this book, uh, by my count. Um, and it routinely tops bestseller lists across the world, even now. Um, in one week of this year in the United States, it sold 24,000 copies in seven days. Uh, just to put that into perspective, there are many books that you've probably uh, heard about, talked with your friends about, um, maybe read in a book club that sold 5,000 copies total uh, in their lifespan. So 24,000 copies in seven days is, is just a huge number. And that's just testament to how um, significant this book is, uh, remains, uh, and and we can we can measure that significance not just by sales but by who the book pisses off, uh, if I can be blunt. So you know, just in May of this year, uh, Alexander Lukashenko, um, the president, prime minister of Belarus, I should know that, uh, pulled this book from bookshelves and prohibited its sale. Um, just two years ago, the Chinese government. Um, uh, didn't ban the book in stores. You can still buy a copy uh, in, in any Chinese bookstore, but all references to 1984 and Animal Farm on social media um, are, I guess, canceled. Uh, they're, they're banned, they're, um, they're erased uh, from social media. So you can't talk about the book in any sort of um, you know, digital way in China. And, uh, in Russia, as I'll talk about near the end, uh, 1984 is uh, is still being talked about right now, and uh, at the highest levels of government, um, at least it's being um, uh, its significance is being argued uh, in a way that that the Russians hope will benefit them in their cause. So I'm going to get to that at the end. You might be surprised to know uh, that this book is a, a bestseller in, in Russia at the moment. Um, so this whole story uh, starts with, um, not with George Orwell, but with, I'm trying to share a screen here with you, hopefully you see it, um, but with someone named uh, Eric Arthur Blair which was George Orwell's given name. And, uh, and Eric Arthur Blair was born in Bengal, uh, Brit British India, 
and he's the son of uh, very prominent imperialists. So um, his mother was uh, French and she comes from a long line of French imperialists. They were involved in, in a teak business. His father helped run um, the opium business for the, for the British. Uh, opium was being sold to the, to the Chinese at the time. And uh, in his lineage um, were prominent slaveholders who, uh, who owned plantations in Jamaica. And in fact, his father was still the absentee owner of those, of those um, plantations when Eric Arthur Blair was born in, in 1903. This is a, a family that uh, is sort of the definition of systematic privilege, you know, to use the language of, of today. Um, they had uh, all the connections. They had been wealthy for a long time. But as you might know, if you know something about um, British history, you know, 1903 is really, uh, it's been described as high noon uh, for the British Empire. Um, things are crumbling. Um, and in fact, uh, Blair's family doesn't have any money anymore. Um, they still have their, uh, their prominence, um, but they, but they're, they're, um, and they're not destitute, but they, they no longer have financial reserves. And, um, Blair's mother can see the writing on the wall. She's worried about her children. So they actually leave Bangle, um, right after he's born and they move back, uh, to, to England. And, um, and Eric Arthur Blair in, is enrolled in a, uh, a, a Catholic convent school um, where he excels well enough to, to um, get a scholarship to a prep school. And there he really shines. Um, and he ends up getting um, what's known as a, a King's Scholarship uh, to attend Eton. And if you know something about like the British royal family, you'll know that a lot of the British royals have gone to Eton. Eton is like the, with Wellington, are, are two of the, the most prominent schools for training um, the, the powerful, the elite uh, in the UK, even to this day. Uh, and that's where Eric Arthur Blair goes. But he's not like everyone else when he gets there. And this is really a, a defining feature of his life. And we're going to see, I think, the effect of this um, experience in 1984, uh, the, the work. But he is someone straddling worlds. So uh, just to make sense of this, he, he described himself at one point as lower upper middle class, uh, which I just glossed over when I was reading about him, lower upper middle class. And then, then I came back to it. I was like, wait a second, lower upper middle class. What does that mean? It's just so British. Uh, and I dug into it and I found um, a scholar who helped explain it. And what it actually means is that um, he's of the middle class. Uh, the lower means that they had no money. Um, the upper means that they used to have a lot of money. <laughs> Um, and the middle class really means uh, that they're not starving, but that the really prominent positions within the government um, are forever closed to Eric Arthur Blair. Um, and yet there he is rubbing elbows and joking with um, the very young men who are going to become leaders of the country. So what we see here is somebody who has one foot in um, uh, in this, you know, very privileged imperial past. Uh, in fact, he's made by the, the empire. And on the other hand, uh, he's not made well enough that he has access to the elite circles that may um, like to. And you can see here uh, pictures of Eric Arthur Blair um, from his convent school, from uh, his prep school, and then at Eton here. Um, and also noteworthy, uh, even already at this time, he's, uh, he's telling people that he's interested in being a writer. Um, he thinks he maybe wants to be a poet, um, then he thinks maybe he wants to be a journalist. Uh, but also, this really has no bearing on anything, but, but one of his teachers at Eton was Aldous Huxley, who ended up writing Brave New World. Uh, and 1984 and Brave New World are probably two of the most revered dystopian novels uh, ever written. 
And they happen, the authors of these books happen to have been in the same classroom at the same time. You might have, you might think Huxley was teaching uh, um, writing, but he wasn't. He was actually teaching French. And Blair was a fan of Huxley, uh, interestingly. So after Eaton, um, while well, all of his chums go on to uh, university, uh, and, and most of them, you know, their parents are giving money to the university's uh, um, donations. You know, they're 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 really they're in these these great universities. He uh, Blair does not have the money to attend the universities, and he's goofed off while at Eton. He's been a, a bit of a um, performer, a rabble rouser, and so uh, he does not earn a scholarship. He goes from having one of the most prestigious scholarships to get into Eton to not even being able to scrape out any scholarship that'll get him to university. So uh, his father um, helps him decide that he should go uh, join the Imperial Police Force. Um, he's somebody who wants to go back east. He wants to travel. And his father thinks that, you know, the Imperial Police Force is going to help sort of grind some discipline into this, into this kid. Um, so Eric Arthur Blair leaves the UK, leaves England, and um, hen, heads to Burma. And in Burma, uh, things become uh, emotionally challenging for Blair. Uh, you can see this picture of him here um, in his uniform. What I should tell you first is, is just sort of set the stage. Uh, the police force, the imperial police force, is not like the police that you might be imagining that we have in the United States. These are, this is a paramilitary force um, that is operating in Burma. Uh, there are, I think if I remember right, there are about, you know, 3,000 of them, um, and they are trying to be the, uh, the law force for about, um, uh, for millions of people, I forget the exact figure, but millions of people, and so they're they're constantly out, and uh, uh, they um, because of that, you know, like police forces tend to do, you know, they uh, they come with shock and awe uh, uh, at their disposal. So um, they're they're not like you know helping people cross streets and stuff. They're um, dragging people out of houses, um, and in in a couple cases, uh, Orwell is exposed to extreme violence while he's there. And he ends up uh, describing the experience in, in interesting ways. Um, uh, it should be known that he was a, um, uh, an outsider within this police force. These, these men were all chummy, um, but, but Blair uh, didn't quite fit in. And it was something, um, a belief that he didn't write until years later. And this is a quote, a quote from, from Blair himself. I had already made up my mind that imperialism was an evil thing. I was all for the Burmese and all against their pressure, oppressors, the British. So he's, he's writing, I should also note, he's writing that at a time when, when um, that was not a a real politically convenient sentiment to have. So you might you might think he's, he was saying that later to sort of expunge his record, but he was actually, that was sort of a bold thing to say at the time that he wrote it. Um, uh, and what's fascinating about it is that he is, you know, of course, the the hand of the law here and, and he's self-hating. Um, he disdains what he's doing and yet he's doing it. And you might think he was bad at his job. Oops, sorry. He was not bad at his job, uh, uh, even if he was reticent. Um, he, in the years after getting back from Burma, he turned to writing. And one of his first, um, one of his great essays that he wrote about the experience is called Shooting an Elephant. And uh, this is an experience that may or may not happen, have happened, but he wrote about it as if it did happen. Um, and this is an essay get, that gets read about gets read as sort of um, the story of the fall of imperialism, the fall of the empire, the elephant being the empire. Um, but what's 
most interesting about this essay to me is uh, that we see this same uh, Blair who become Orwell as someone who is occupying a role that he doesn't quite believe in. So here's a quote from Shooting the Elephant. Um, and just to set this up, I'll, I'll let you know that uh, this elephant had been causing problems. He was called there to solve the problem. When he got there, he realized the only way to solve the problem was to shoot the elephant. Um, elephant elephants in Burma are like as valuable as, I don't know, a semi truck might be, you know, they're used for all sorts of um, transportation. It's a big deal to shoot an elephant. It's um, a lot of uh, investment has gone into this elephant, but this elephant's causing problems. Uh, and the, the crowd that's assembled around him, many people, they want this elephant to be shot before it destroys more things. So um, uh, he wrote later, I perceived in this moment that when the white man turns tyrant, it is his own freedom that he destroys. He becomes a sort of hollow posing dummy. He wears a mask and his face grows to fit it. So, you know, to imagine this moment, he doesn't want to shoot the elephant. He's never shot an elephant before. He doesn't know how to shoot an elephant. The crowd wants him as the embodiment of the empire, of the law, of the rule of law, to come here and solve this problem for, for them. And the experience makes him feel hollow, makes him feel like he's posing, makes him feel like he's wearing a mask and that his face has grown to fit it. And so I'm going to argue a bit later that that, that that passage really echoes with what happens in 1984, the book, and what happened to Orwell uh, in the time before and immediately after he wrote the book. Uh, so just keep that that one in mind. Okay, so Orwell comes home, um, and when he comes home, he decides to, or Blair comes home, and when he just when he comes home, he decides to to tell his family that he's going to be a writer. He's no longer interested in uh, being on the imperial police force, and he just sort of um, resigns spur of the moment from the police force, and he spends almost immediately he changes his name to George Orwell. Uh, and lots of people have wondered why. Um, interestingly, or the, the River Orwell is the river that runs near his house, uh, his parents' house in the countryside, and he loved the countryside. Um, so perhaps he named himself after this big, slow, winding river. It's a poetic image. Um, but in any case, uh, even his, this was not just a name, a pen name that he used while publishing. This is a name that he insisted people call him. Uh, and his his wife, uh, in later years when he was married, um, called him George, who is very much more like he became a new person when he came home. He wanted to reinvent himself. Uh, and we don't know much about his thinking behind why he did it, but it's, it's pretty striking that this person who feels like he's wearing a mask comes home and changes his name. He ends up uh, traveling around, uh, tutoring. Um, he ends up teaching at a boys' school. You can see this picture of him here um, in, in, as a teacher. Notice how tall he is. Here, here's another grown man uh, on the left. And notice how tall Orwell is here. That's going to be significant when he goes to war. Uh, Orwell really doesn't seem like someone who knew who he was in those years. Uh, back in England. He um, he really, the writing he's doing is not very good. Uh, it's not even really read anymore, um, uh, most of it. And he seems to be kind of floundering about. Uh, he ends up marrying someone uh, and promptly after marrying her, decides to leave and join the Spanish Civil War, uh, which is uh, has begun um, and if you know something about this, you know, the, the Soviets are involved with, with one force um, uh, and the, the Spanish Civil War becomes this very messy conflict. 
Uh, but Orwell was not like the solitary brave hero who left England to go help fight the fascists, which was what he wanted to do. He wanted to kill fascists in his words. Uh, there were actually thousands of young Britons going to this war because they wanted to, to fight and prove themselves, maybe in the same way that like the Hemingways of America, you know, had um, hurried to Europe before, you know, the United States was involved in World War I. Um, these are young men who who want to fight. And well, well, Orwell's there. He actually finds, uh, you know, combat uh, and he ends up being shot through the neck by a sniper. He just couldn't get it through his head that he needed to stay hunched over in the trench where he was um, standing. Uh, everyone else, you know, is is shorter than him. And he stands up, puts his head above the trench and a sniper shoots him through the neck. And now this should have killed him. Orwell should have died. Uh, uh, but the bullet, just by like, a, a, you know, a, a measurement that you can't even take, it's so small, missed his artery. Uh, it missed his spine. And he ends up convalescing uh, in a Spanish hospital um, and contracts TB while he's there. And this is really the end of, of his health. Uh, he's not an old man at this point, you know, he's still young, but he's never healthy again. And, and that, that plays a, a, a prominent role in, in what happens to him after. So World War II breaks out. And uh, what I should say before I get to World War II briefly is that uh, in Spain wanting to kill fascists and the force that he fought um, with uh, suddenly became an enemy of the Soviet Union. After the Soviet Union, after the Soviets had sort of helped this force, all of a sudden the Soviets turned on them. The Soviets said the force was, quote, objectively fascist. And the very people he'd been fighting with then began to fight against the force that he had been um, uh, part of. And this experience of sort of the friends becoming foes because of what the Soviets had said, you know, objectively fascist, uh, really stuck with him. It haunted him. It pissed him off in a way that he'd never been angry before. Uh, all of a sudden, this, this person who'd been sort of wobbling um, around, who didn't really know who he was, he became galvanized in his hatred for the Soviets. Uh, and this is important because when World War II breaks out in Orwell's mind, it's actually just a continuation of the fight that had been happening in Spain. And he seems to have to think that uh, the Allied powers, what became the Allied powers, were going to end up in, with Nazi Germany and the Soviets. Um, and it, for a couple of years, he's actually saying that it, uh, that Britain itself is going to enter into a civil war just like Spain's. And so he actually thinks that World War II is going to be a lot bigger and messier um, than this giant messy war ended up being. Um, he was pretty shocked that, that Britons did not go to war against their own ruling party um, uh, during this conflict. Um, and he's surprised when everyone sort of rallies around um, the flag and fights, um, you know, for for his country. Um, but as soon as the war breaks out, he sees another chance to sort of prove himself in conflict, and he tries to sign up, but they don't they don't let him fight. Um, so he ends up on the home guard, and you'll see a picture of him here uh, in England. This is a force of mostly people who. Um, uh, had, you know, some injury or medical um, condition or were too old to go fight uh, the Nazis in Europe. So they're staying home in case the Nazis invade. Uh, he's well liked here, but but because um, he's one of the few who's actually seen combat and has, uh, you know, experience. Um, but his health is too poor for him really to contribute. That TB is troubling him. Um, uh, but his, his body seems to be breaking down in, in many ways. Uh, and it's not just his body. It's also his, uh, his mental health. Um, at the time, you know, there wasn't the language to talk about his 
mental health that we have now. But we know that he was struggling. Uh, and we know that because when he's convalescing back in Spain, uh, he's actually given electroshock treatment to try to stabilize his mental health. Um, and knowing that, when you read the end of 1984, you may you may feel some resonances between that that machine of electricity that's torturing him on the table at the hands of O'Brien and this experience that he had in Spain while still recovering from this, this wound to his neck. So he's not well physically, he's not well mentally, and he loses his position on the home guard. But he's already a semi-prominent writer and the BBC, uh, or actually the, you know, the, the British government decides that he can be of use um, creating propaganda for them. So he goes to work for an arm of the BBC that is actually an arm of the British government. Um, and he's uh, disseminating, he's creating propaganda and he's disseminating that propaganda uh, across um, the British East. So back in uh, India, um, uh, and, you know, these places that, that, uh, in Burma, um, and what's fascinating about this is that this is a moment of major productivity for or Orwell. All of a sudden, you know, this person who's been, who wasn't sure who he was, who wanted to fight, wasn't well enough to fight, sort of found himself in his hatred of the Soviets. Now he finds a creative outlet that really jives with him. He's uh, he's excels at creating this propaganda for the BBC, disseminating it. And this is when he starts writing uh, Animal Farm. So Animal Farm is published and uh, it's published, you know, right near the end of World War II, um, right when the West is now entering the Cold War with the Soviets. And Orwell, interestingly, is sometimes credited with coining the term Cold War. Uh, and, and the book Animal Farm, um, it, it, it's obviously a, a brilliant novel. Uh, it, it would have had its own life even without the help of the CIA. But the CIA and the Foreign Service in um, the British Foreign Service worked to actually promote this book and disseminate it across Europe. Uh, the CIA at one point was airdropping this book from balloons across the Soviet empire. Uh, so Orwell goes to help the propaganda machine um, with the BBC, and then the forces behind the propaganda machine start to help Orwell. You might be, you know, if you've read 1984, you might be feeling some resonances with the end of that book. Um, uh, hold on to those. So Animal Farm is published. It is uh, uh, a, a, an amazing success. And Orwell becomes a very prominent figure. Um, he's traveling around. Uh, he's, a, he's a literary figure. Um, and his wife tragically dies uh, during surgery. Um, and it's a big shock to him. Uh, and so this, this sort of one crutch that he had going in his life um, uh, still had going, you know, his, his physical health is deteriorated, his mental health is deteriorated. He has his wife and then she tragically dies. And what he has left is writing and literature. And in the, the year after her death, he publishes 130 articles, most of them political in nature. Uh, he also begins writing 1984. In 1984, the writing of it, um, he can feel that he is dying. He is a dying man. Lifespan you know, is coming to its end. This is probably going to be his last work. And he pours everything he has into this book. Now, uh, we don't know much about his writing process or how he planned things out, what influenced him. He didn't keep a journal. He didn't tell lots of people. He didn't even tell his agent what he was doing. Um, but it's clear this book 
is personal for Orwell in a way that other works weren't. Um, you know, it's it's so focused on emotion and the emotional experience, um, which does, you know, from my vantage point, does make sense. You know, he's someone whose physical health is deteriorated uh, and sort of that thing, his wife, you know, who is drawing him out of himself is no longer there. Now he's in many ways locked inside himself and his emotions. Uh, and and it's no wonder that the book is so focused on the emotional experience of, of living in a government that is um, oppressive. Now, when the book is published, um, it is instantly uh, read through this lens of politics. And the old influences um, of the British Foreign Service and the American CIA who'd helped distribute Animal Farm and make sure everyone was reading and talking about Animal Farm, they go to work on behalf of 1984. And so the dominant reading of 1984 to this day, it um, maintains that uh, Stalin-like uh, figure um, uh, or situ you know, totalitarian um, um, governance coming to England. Um, um, in the two minutes hate Goldstein, um, uh, you know, if you've read the book, you know that the people uh, uh, are compelled to come stand in front of this telly screen like a television and hate on this person um, who's described uh, in a way that looks just like Trotsky here. Uh, um, and Big Brother, uh, is described in a way that really fits Stalin. So this reading definitely works with the novel, that the novel is about um, living under a Soviet-like state. But we can't forget, really, that this book is set in London. And I'm going to read you just a, a brief passage here. Um, this is the, the opening of the book. But we are we are hearing here about London in um, immediately post war and during the war. This this description I'm about to provide you uh, absolutely matches the physical reality of of London immediately after the war. It was a bright, cold day in April, and the clocks were striking thirteen. Winston Smith his chin nuzzled into his breast in an effort to escape the vile wind, slipped quickly through the glass doors of victory mansions, though not quickly enough to prevent a swirl of gritty dust from entering along behind him. Right, that swirl of gritty dust, you can see it right here. This is, uh, you know, the dust of explosions, potentially. Um, and, and, you know, the uh, rubble after an explosion. The hallway smelt of boiled cabbage and old mats. At one, one end of it, a colored poster, too large for indoor display, had been tacked to the wall. It depicted simply an enormous face, more than a meter wide, the face of a man of about 45 with a heavy black mustache and ruggedly handsome features. Okay. Now, this is a poster on the left side of the screen here. This is a poster that was uh, all over London during the war. And so the neat reading that, you know, he's describing Stalin, yes, that, that could be true. Um, perhaps, though, he is describing this poster. Um, I think it's a benefit to the novel that it can be read either way. Um, and I'll get more to that here in a minute. But ultimately, uh, uh, if we remember what um, what Orwell had written, I'd already made up my mind that imperialism uh, was an evil thing. And we remember that the the imperialist wears a mask and his face grows to fit it. right? If we remember these past quotes, uh, and and um, we remember also something that, that really troubled Orwell that I forgot to mention. I should have mentioned this. Orwell wrote in his wartime diary in 1941 that no one 
could not, no one could have a better example of the moral and emotional shallowness of our time than the fact that we are now all more or less pro-Stalin. This disgusting murderer is temporarily on our side, and so the purges, etc., are suddenly forgotten. Right? Even in this in this passage from his wartime diary, you can hear that contrarian voice. And though the West tends to read 1984 as a warning against Stalin-like figures and Soviet-like governance. Um, there's also a strong argument to be made that that Orwell's actually arguing against or warning of something um, less partisan. Uh, he is potentially warning against um, some some dangers, the intoxication of power uh, that exists within all government forces. And I should say that when the book is published, uh, it immediately is panned by all the communist newspapers in England um, and, and Great Britain um, and praised by all the, um, the other uh, institutions, other um, journals there, excuse me. Um, and, uh, and immediately, it's a book that's being talked about in Soviet Russia. And the Soviets, just as the West has been trying to spin this book uh, to make it anti-Soviets, the Soviets spin it to try to make it anti uh, the West. And they argue that, uh, that this is um, a quote from a, um, a state owned newspaper uh, about 1984, um, the book 1984. Uh, every year, it's clearer and clearer that Orwell, unwittingly or no, unknowingly, one could argue the latter, had painted not a caric caricature of socialism and communism, but quite a realistic picture of contemporary capitalistic empiricism. Uh, the, um, so the, the Soviets are arguing that this is actually a book warning about the dangers of liberalism. And you'll find this fascinating, I think, that just a couple weeks ago, um, the spokesperson for Russia's foreign ministry rejected the idea that 1984 was about um, Russia's authoritarianism and said it was about, quote, the end of Western liberalism. For many years, we believed that Orwell described the horrors of totalitarianism. This is the biggest global fakes, <laughs> the spokesperson said. He actually depicted how liberalism would lead humanity to a dead end. And so from the beginning, but even now, there's this argument about what Orwell was getting at. Is he warning about um, Liberalism is he arguing um, or warning about totalitarianism, and uh, I don't have an answer for that for you. Uh, but I do, um, I do think that it's really significant that we see this parallel in George Orwell's life, where he goes from being a uh, from being a someone who who uh, argued against and, and really felt against imperialism, felt against the British Empire in some ways, to being someone who worked so hard to actually benefit the empire. Um, he, he began disseminating that propaganda. In later years, he compiled lists. He compiled a list of people who couldn't be trusted to write well about the British Empire. Um, and he did that for his friends in the forest ser foreign service. So he really comes to be to allow himself to be an agent of this uh, force that he um, had some hesitation about. And in the book, there's so much about sanity, right? And about, uh, uh, I don't have time to dig into the passages here. I wished I, I planned to, um, but uh, about, you know, lunacy and sanity, and you can't be, um, you know, sane as a member of one, right? You need to be part of a, a group. And so in the end, uh, Winston Smith, you know, finds his sanity by 
joining the movement. And the final lines are quite haunting in respect to, to Orwell's own life. He had won the victory over himself. He loved Big Brother. So, yeah. Uh, there's so much more to say about this book and to really dive into this book. Um, but I'd love to to see if if you have questions here and if perhaps you do, um, you can post those in the question and our, our screen. Um, uh, Orwell's book continues um, to sell in the United States in times when we fear we're slipping into totalitarianism. Uh, it sold especially well under Trump, as you can imagine. And maybe you are one of those readers who uh, underlined a specific passage that really felt like it, it rang in our current moment. Uh, ultimately, I think 1984 is a book that will continue to sell for as long as there are books selling, as long as there are governments, um, because it is a book that is written um, by someone who is straddling worlds. It might be read as a political partisan novel, but it's a human novel. And Orwell is not, uh, you know, so consumed with uh, which side is right. He's consumed with this idea of what happens when the connections that people make between themselves no longer matter, what happens when the past is erased, like when those purges are forgotten, what happens when, um, when, right, when these bonds between people um, disappear. And I, as a, as a last note in this, in this um, way of thinking, I want to quote Eric Fromm here, who, who wrote about uh, 1984 and does so in a way that I think really captures this straddling um, approach that, that Orwell took. George Orwell's 1984 is the expression of a mood, and it is a warning. The mood it expresses is that, that of near despair about the future of humanity. And the warning is that unless, of course, history changes, humanity will, men, he says, men from all over the world will lose their most human qualities, will become soulless automon, automa, auto, um, how do you say that word? Soulless automat, automat, matons, matons. I've never said that word and will not even be aware of it. Okay, so unless we change the course of, uh, of our path, we're going to lose our human qualities. We're gonna become soulless and we won't even become aware of it. And yes, and we see this here in, in, um, in 1984, um, especially with Julia. I'd really love to dig in there, but um, um, I think we have questions here. Brooke asks, as of today, what is an example you see of thematic similarity between 1984 and whiskey? Whoa, thanks, Brooke. Uh, yeah. Uh, I'll say that from an author's point of view, I, I, I've tried to say, I've tried to argue here that, um, that George Orwell approached this book by straddling, by double thinking, really, by believing two things at once. Um, and uh, with whiskey, definitely, I tried to uh, straddle worlds as well, um, to both have on one level, like a romanticism of the West, and to also question that romanticism and not believe in it, um, to believe in good and evil, and also to believe at the same time that there's no such thing as good or evil. Um, so on a thematic level, you know, there are many themes in 1984, many themes in, in whiskey. I would argue that uh, um, those themes, when, when a novelist is writing and the novelist tries to double think, to believe two things at once, and to give equal power to both things, uh, that those themes are able to rise up um, more clearly through the through the text. And in the case of 1984, um, it is that openness that Orwell brought to the writing of the book that I think has has allowed it to last as long as it has um, to have the resonance that it continues to have. Um, yeah. That's a cool question. Thank you. 
so in, in case other people, um, feel free to post other questions. Uh, I'm going to take us to a passage here. This is on page 136 in my book. Uh, and this is when Julia and um, Winston are, are talking about the war. And as you'll remember, the, the bad guys keep changing um, in, in the story that Big Brother is telling, that the, the party is telling. And uh, uh, Winston, it's, it's really a shock to him that Julia doesn't remember who the enemy was and she doesn't seem to care. Uh, and what she says really resonates, I think, with the current moment. She says, who cares? It's always one bloody war after another. And, and everyone knows the news is all lies anyway. And why that really resonates with me is because, gosh, like the people I know who um, continue to support Trump uh, and when in conversations about, you know, January 6th, you hear that same phrase, who cares? The news is all lies anyway, right? Um, and, and yeah, uh, there's something you know, deeply resonant about the way that um, the characters in this book are sort of beaten down into not caring about things they should really care about. And uh, for me personally, it's deeply haunting to then look around at people who just five, eight years ago uh, were sort of the most vocal patriots I knew. And now they're talking about uh, not caring about the capital being raided, right? There's something um, uh, just tr deeply troubling about that. Um, Barbara says, personal privacy versus today's ubiqui ubiquitous video, right? Definitely. Um, as Snowden pointed out, you know, we, we uh, are surveilled. As many of us know, our social media accounts are uh, used to feed us products. Um, and maybe your Alexa is listening. Uh, certainly the, the surveillance mechanisms within 1984 that when the book was published, those would have been really um, futuristic, right? Oh my gosh, a telly screen that's listening to you. Uh, but now we have our, our, you know, Echo Dots and our um, Alexas uh, that are literally listening to us. And we let them do it because they give us something. They give us convenience. You know, we, we want to find out we're in an argument with someone and we want to uh, find out who's right. We just say, hey, Alexa, right? Um, they give us something in return. And so we give over privacy to them. And the same kind of thing is happening in 1984 with Winston. You know, he has a job. He doesn't have to worry about that. He has food. It might not be all the food he wants, um, but he has it. He has these comforts that uh, people might not have had a lot of during the war um, that Orwell had just gone through. And in exchange for those comforts, they've given up their privacy. They've given up um, their freedom of expression. They've given up their freedom to love. They're giving up their freedom um, to do math, right? And it's a slippery slope. Uh, Orwell's book is about one snapshot in time, but this novel could have been written over a series of you know years. It could have imagined its scope as over a series of years. And we could have seen these people sliding deeper and deeper into this state. Um, uh, and sometimes it feels like we might be sliding deeper and deeper into that state. Uh, but I will say that everyone who's read this book since it was published has probably had that same experience of feeling like, oh, we're on that slippery slope. Um, it's just, where are we on the slippery slope? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so I'll, I'll end by saying that uh, 1984 um, uh, does carry a dark mood. Um, and I think a lot of uh, casual readers might not want to enter that dark mood at this point in, in our own history. Uh, that makes sense. Um, but it's warnings, these warnings that, that Orwell found, wrote his way to um, as he was dying, as he was thinking, um, what's the last thing I want to leave on this earth? Uh, these warnings are, are worth reading, worth heeding, worth thinking about. Um, and it's said that, you know, 
novels should lift a mirror to their time, um, that they should be, you know, novels should be holding up a mirror on, on their time and place. And definitely, this is one of the rare political books that you can read anytime, anywhere, and see yourself reflected. And it's scary. All right, thank you, John. That was uh, that was fantastic. Uh, brilliant review of that. Uh, <laughs> so much to think about. Um, and so thank you so much for coming and uh, taking the time to review for us. All right, uh, so that concludes it for today. Thank you so much and I uh, hope to see you all next time. Thank you and have a good afternoon. Thanks all for coming. <laughs>